In this video, I'll be introducing contravariant functors and some properties of functors that I didn't introduce last time. So a very quick thing about functors is that if we have a functor from C to D and that we have it that C and D are both locally small, what I can create are the component functions between two objects A and B. So I can say F a, B for two objects, A, B of, and I can create a function, which I define as this is from the HOM set between A, B into the HOM set on F of A, F of B, which because these are locally small, I can actually have a function. All right, specifically what it'll do is it'll send an arrow F, which is from A to B, as it's an element of this HOM set and it'll send that to the functor applied to the arrow, which is from f of a to f of b. And you can see how that is then a, an element of this HOM set. So this is really just the restriction of the functor to the arrows between two objects, which allows us to analyze the fullness or faithfulness of this functor as it restricts us to only arrows. And then the properties of fullness and faithfulness are just the surjectivity and injectivity of this uh, new component. Functions. And this is only true for locally small categories. Now, an example of a functor that I should probably introduce is the HOM functor. So if I have the HOM set with A and an empty slot, this is going to be from a locally small category into the category of sets. What it'll do is it'll send an object B of C to the HOM set uh, from A to B. And it'll send an arrow F to this new function C of AF. So let's say I have F from B to C. This will create a new arrow C of AF, which is from C of AB into C of A, C. What it'll do is it'll send some arrow from A to B, let's call it G, and it'll send that to, well, let's go ahead and write out what we have so far. We have from B to C, we have F, and then from A to B, we have G. And we wanna create an arrow from A to C. Well, I think, I think it's pretty obvious what we have to do, we have to compose it. So we have to do f compose g, so f compose g. Now let's go ahead and look at the composition of this HOM set. So if I have c of g composed f, I have to prove that this is equal to c of a g composed c of a f in order for this to work. So let's go ahead and apply this to a certain function. So let's say we apply this to h. This is then by definition equal to G composed F composed H, which by associativity is going to be equal to G composed F composed H. Now F composed H is by the definition right here is the function C of A F applied to H. And then from the definition again, this is going to be C of A G that entire thing uh, applied on C of A, F applied on H, which then by the definition of composition on functions, it's just the composition in set. And so that makes it abundantly clear that we actually do have a functor. Now let me go ahead and prove a property of functors in general. So if I have a functor from C to D, and I know that it has a two-sided inverse, or that it is an isomorphism, then, uh, then it will preserve the following. It will preserve monics, epics, initial objects, and terminal objects. And note that it has to be an isomorphism. This is not true in general. So if I have a monic f from a to b, then the new arrow, f of f, from f of a to f of b, is also a monic. Let's go ahead and prove it. So straight from the definition of monics, what we need to prove is that f of the monic composed g1 equals f of f 
compose G2 implies G1 equals G2. So that's what I'm going to prove. I'm just going to take a lot of steps to get to it. By the fact that the functor has an inverse, what I can do is instead of writing G1, I can write F of F inverse of G1. And that will give me the same thing. And then I can do that on the other side as well. F of F inverse of G2. Which then, by the fact that this is a functor, I can combine this composition into one. So this is F of F composed F inverse of G1, which is going to have to be equal to F of F composed F inverse of G2. Which then, if I apply the inverse functor to both sides of this equation, I can get rid of those Fs, and I can get F composed F inverse of G1 is equal to F composed F inverse of G2. Which, by the fact that F is a monic, we have it that F inverse of G1 is equal to F inverse of G2. Which then, if I apply the functor to both sides, I can cancel out those F inverses, and I can get G1 is equal to G2. And that is exactly what we wanted to prove. So F of F is a monic. And this relied heavily on the fact that it was an isomorphism. So you can tell that this is not true in general. Now let's go ahead and prove it for initial objects just for fun. Uh, if I have an initial object C, then F of C is an initial object. So let's assume that there is an object of D, of the codomain. Then what I need to do, by the definition of an initial object, is I need to create a unique arrow, F, from the initial object F of C into the new object D. How on earth could I construct that? Well, what I'm going to do is look at F inverse of D, which is an object of C. Which then, by the fact that it's an object of C, means that there is a unique morphism, F, from the initial object, C, into F inverse on D. Which then, I can create the new functor, F of F, which is from F of C into D. And so, right there is the necessary morphism. And to show that this is, in fact, unique, if I were to have some other morphism, G, from F of C to D, I can do F inverse on G, which is from C to F inverse on D. By the uniqueness of this morphism, that means that F inverse of G is equal to F, which means that G is F of F. And that is the morphism we constructed. And so this right here is the unique between those. Now let me go ahead and introduce contravariant functors. Now what a contravariant functor is, is it's written exactly like a functor, and it does have an assignment between the objects of C and the objects of D. So for every object C, there is F of C an object of D. And there is an assignment of arrows, so if I have an arrow F from A to B within C, then I can create a new arrow F of F, which is not going between F of A to F of B. Instead, we flip it. So it's from F of B to F of A. So in flipping the order of the domain and codomain, we can create a different structure from normal functors. Now the third condition is the same as it was. Uh, F applied to an identity is the identity of F applied to that object. And now four has to be written a little differently. F of the composition is flipping the order of the composition in the image. So F of F composed G is equal to f of g composed f of f. So it flipped the order. Now a nice simple example of one of these contravariant functors is the contravariant power set functor, which is from set to set. It'll send a set x to the power set of x, and it'll send a function f from x to y. It will send that to p bar of f, which is from the power set on y into the power set on x, 
what it'll do is it'll send a subset of y to the pre-image along this map applied to it. So whereas the covariant, which is a normal functor, so whereas the covariant power set functor sends you to the image, the contravariant power set functor sends you to the pre-image. Now, the thing about contravariant functors is that they really are just normal functors, just written a little weird. So if I have a contravariant functor, f from c to d, what I can construct is a covariant functor, f bar, from c up into d. Now how I define this is I'll send an object a to just the normal functor f applied to a. And it'll send an arrow f, and because this is in the opposite category, it's f up to the normal contravariant functor applied to the underlying arrow. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like. If I have f up from b to a, then I'll have f from a to b, because that's what f up is. It's just flipping the domain and codomain. And then by the fact that this is a contravariant functor, f of f is going to be from f of b to f of a, which look at that b to a, f of b to f of a. And so overall, this is a covariant functor. And just so that you're even more convinced, f bar applied to f op composed g op is going to be equal to f bar applied to, by the definition, g composed f quantity op. That's just straight from the definition of composition on opposite arrows, which then by the definition of f bar, this is going to be equal to f applied to g composed f, which by the fact f is contravariant, this is equal to f of f, switching the order, composed f of g, which by the definition of f bar is equal to f bar of f up, composed f bar of g up, which you can see we flipped the order twice and we ended up getting the composition in the right order for it to be a normal functor. So you can see that if this is a contravariant functor, this is a covariant functor. And what you can also see is that if this is actually a covariant functor in the first place, that this will actually create a contravariant functor. Although I'll leave that to you to prove. Put your answers in the comments below. Now the reason why I wrote this as f bar instead of something like f op it's because f op is actually another object, which is from c op to d op. And it'll send an object a to the functor applied to a, and it'll send an arrow f op to f applied to the underlying arrow quantity opposite. What this does is it makes opposite, op, a functor from the categories into the categories. So it'll send a category to its opposite category and it'll send a functor to its opposite functor. And I'll leave it to you to prove that the composition of functors op is just the composition of their opposite functors. It's not that hard. It just follows a lot of what we're doing. Now the thing about contravariant functors as opposed to covariant functors is that they actually switch the properties I was saying here. So if I have a contravariant functor from C to D, an isomorphism, and an isomorphic contravariant functor is just one with a two-sided inverse, same exact definition, then it actually switches it. So monics, when a contravariant functor is applied to a monic, you actually get an epic and vice versa. If you apply it to an epic, you get a monic. And same thing with initial terminal. So if I have an initial object, then this is going to be switched out with a terminal object when I apply a contravariant functor. So I'll just go ahead and prove it for monics and you'll be able to see what I mean. So if I do F applied to a monic, I'm trying to prove that this is an epic. So I do G1 composed it equals g2 composed it. And now I want to prove then that g1 equals g2. So let's go ahead and do it out. Let's use the inverse functor again. So I have f of f inverse applied to g1 
composed f of f is equal to f of f inverse of g2 composed f of f. Which then, by the fact this is a contravariant functor, I can move that composition within it as long as I switch the order I'm composing them in. So like that. And this is going to be equal to f of f composed f inverse of g2. Which then, I can apply the inverse functor to both sides, cancel out the f, I get f composed f inverse of g1 is equal to f composed f inverse of g2. Which by the fact that it is a monic, that means that f inverse of g1 is equal to f inverse of g2. Which then means that g1 is equal to g2. Ah, look at that. Because it's contravariant, we actually get to switch the order of this composition, meaning we switch between monics and epics. And then you can prove that for epics, back to monics, and then initial to terminal, terminal to initial. I'll leave that to you. It's very similar. Now I'm going to take a side course off from all of this contravariant, covariant, preservation stuff, and just talk about subcategories. So if I'm given a category C, a subcategory D is going to be a category such that every object of D is an object of C, and that every arrow of D is an arrow of C, and that composition in D is just composition in C. It's sum of the objects, sum of the arrows, and composition is the same. Then a very clear functor is the inclusion functor, which is from the subcategory D into the category C. And it'll send an object to itself and an arrow to itself. The properties of this functor determines the properties of the subcategory. Oh my god. Now we say that the category D is full if uh, iota is full. So if this is a full functor, then we say that D is full. And clearly iota is faithful, so we don't need to worry about that. So let's do an example. If I have the category and metric spaces met, and I have the subcategory of complete metric spaces. So right here, it's the metric spaces under isometries. And right here, it's the complete metric spaces under those same exact isometries. And so very clearly, because every single isometry in the complete metric spaces is literally just an isometry here, there's no removal of arrows between them. And so if I, have, if I look at the components of this inclusion map between, say, x and y, this is going to be a function from the HOM set between x and y and the HOM set in the metric space between x and y. But notice that these are actually equal to each other. That's straight from the definition of the complete metric spaces. Complete metric spaces really don't have added structure, and so there's no restriction of the arrows between them. They're just still the same exact isometries. And so by the fact that these are equal to each other, this is a bijection, meaning it's full. So iota is full, which means that the subcategory of the metric spaces is also full. So this inclusion map allows us to classify subcategories in whether or not they remove arrows. And that's it.